thank you very much. And welcome to the 10th Annual Bayview Wadden Poetry Recital. I would like to introduce our host for the evening, a man who for 10 years has spearheaded this event and who has been an advocate for the Baby Wadden Library for many more. Uh, he's a poet in his own right, and I'd like you to give a nice warm welcome to Mr. Larry Ware. Thank you and a good evening and welcome to our 10th annual. It is indeed an honor and a pleasure to uh, once again be here this evening and uh, I see a wonderful turnout here. Uh, it is uh, customary that we pay tribute to those who are not here with us this evening to share this program and uh, I would like to um, dedicate this, uh, our 10th anniversary to uh, some uh, inspirational people over the years to us, like uh, the great uh, blues jazz singer Joe Williams, Mel Torme, who wrote the song, uh, um, the Christmas song for Nat King Cole, which is one of my all-time favorites. Uh, Mr. Brad Johnson, who stayed down the street, uh, 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 a neighbor and uh, a musician. Um, Joel Suggs, uh, many of you may not know him, he was a fellow council member and a strong advocate and a wonderful person. Uh, he's uh, not here this evening. And, uh, and one of our greatest athletes of all time, uh, uh, Will Chamberlain, uh, uh, all the kids coming up, all the guys, they wanted to be another Will Chamberlain or Bill Russell, you know, and an inspiration to want to be like a, a Will Chamberlain. Like, there had to be a beginning like a Bill Russell, Will Chamberlain, Dr. J, Spencer Haywood, on up to Michael Jordan. And uh, somebody had to start it. And, uh, okay, uh, we're going to uh, get the show on the road, but before we do, I'd like to... Um, um, uh, speak of a gentleman who's uh, responsible for all of this wonderful artwork here, uh, Malik uh, Senefer Um uh, Senefero is a philosopher, a teacher, and poet, world traveler, and innate visual artist born April 7, 1971 in San Francisco, California. Senefero's work has been well appreciated in museums and galleries, uh, news articles, schools, cafes, etc. In the spring of 1997, before making his solo trip to Kenya, Sanaferu was commissioned for the mural entitled Mungu 9 by 102 in San Francisco's McAteer High School and also curated a children's exhibit called Kali Ancestors, which, is, which was dedicated to Rosa Parks. Santa Ferro's technique of delivering messages to the world is revolutionary in content and in consciousness. His painting consistently portray the life and struggle of black people worldwide, from youth to adults to elders to community and family matters. The coherence and conceptualization in his art has been unbroken. Santa Ferro's work has manifested a persistent and profound concern for modern day depression and the all human effort towards liberalization and justice. Art and spirituality are driving forces in Santa Ferro's life today. He is largely self-taught with a style that is uniquely his own. Santa Ferro has an wavering uh, faith to paint from his heart the reality of this experience and to express in a positive manner. Santa Ferro enjoys being bearer of the message to everyone and to especially welcome any opportunity to carry the creative creativity to children. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Malik Santa Ferro. Uh, he's going to come up and do some poetry and say some words. Come on up, give a great, great round of applause. Great artwork, great artwork. All right, okay, all right. Peace, everyone. Uh, I don't know about doing no poetry, but uh, 
But, you know, I, I'm just here today because I'm glad that the community is out here. Give yourself, give yourselves a hand. Yeah. Yeah, and um, uh, we really need to support more venues like this. We have so many venues here in Bayview Hunters Point, and we have so many actors and poets and writers and things like that. We need to support them to keep these things running. And if none of us are here at the, the gatherings or supporting each other or coming up and just saying, you know, that's a great thing you did, you know, then we lose our writers and we lose our great geniuses of our community. So um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about my work. And uh, uh, I was born here in uh, San Francisco. Um, I was in, born in inner city. My work was inspired by uh, many things like good times. I'm sure a lot of people have seen them and stuff like that. Um, my parents were very strict with me, so if I got bad grades, I had to, you know, sit in my room and think about what I did. So during this time of sitting in my room a long time, you know, until I got good grades, uh, I had some, you know, sketch paper hidden up underneath my bed. You know, I had a little, or either I had a paper bag or something like that, and I would look out of my window, and I would look at the images of the sky. I was always connected to the sky. If you look at maybe this piece here, you can kind of tell Beautiful. my connections that I have with the universe. So as I got older, um, I began working with um, actually selling uh, candy. You know, I started selling candy all around the Bay Area. And um, I got to know people. You know, and I began seeing people and I became very interested in doing drawing faces and portraits and things like that. And so a lot of my work is very figurative and a lot of my work says a lot and to me means a whole lot. Um, my whole aim and purpose to doing my work is to actually teach the viewer and then also uh, kind of take the viewer on a bit of a flight. Um, he, he read early here that you know, I'm a bit of a world traveler, I haven't been many places, but um, the places that I have been, um, those places have stemmed me to go more. Um, I went to Haiti, and then when I went to Africa, I realized how both of them were so much the same. So um, it's very important, I, I, I work with children, I used to work at the Betrayal Hill neighborhood house. And also, right now, I'm working at the SFES and the Beacon Project up at Gloria R. Davis. I teach drawing classes, and right now, um, maybe I want to talk a little bit about my classes because I'm, I need some students. And um, so, at the end of this program, if you know any child who wants to draw or anything like that, you can come and get the information from me. Um, I was born artist, I've never been to college for my work but I'm very well schooled in this business or this, or this profession. So I'll just say I thank you and enjoy. Thank you. All right. Okay, um, we're gonna get this party started. Okay. <laughs> um, our first poet is going to be um, LaShonda Smith. Uh, come forward, please. Let's give her a great round of applause. Yeah. My poem is called Another Rhyme. Little girl, grown up, little gr grown girl, we've cried. We've held ourselves, we've rocked to the rhythm of tears, turning pain to peace. Rise up now, woman, adore yourself. Let your light and beauty shine. All right, 
Uh, next part is going to be uh, Lashanti Smith. Sister. Let's give her a big round of applause. Good evening. I'm going to read two poems. One is called Can't Get Off. While writing, while writing, can't get off. Too loud, pushing the shovel, making me fall. Can't, I can't, I get off and forget everything that happened on the bus. The next one is called, I Can Fly. I can fly with birds and deep blue sea. Hello, colorful rainbow. Goodbye, deep blue sea. There see the eagles be playing with friends beside me. This poem is fun. This poem is free. This poem is me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next poet is going to be, uh, excuse me, um, Craig Cohen. Uh, all right, there, Craig. Been a long time. All right. How you been doing? All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Craig Cohen. Um, I've kind of been writing, what about one? <laughs> Uh, put it closer? Okay. I wrote about one or two poems for this event. I kind of finished my second one, but here's my first one. Uh, it's called, I call it Fortune's War. War of caste, cascading on my people. Racist jerks, hurting my people. Pain and sorrow, engulfing my people. As the book goes by the great horn spoon, jaded sensibilities cloud my judgment. Nice guys finish last if they finish at all. The dead mummies of my people, the dreams, the dream to die in a bed of money. Oh, how sad is the plight and pain of my people. Ragged carpet itching on my people's floor, death in the very air we breathe. Pollution in the soul of my people, the dark ink of hate, fear, and paranoia cloud my people's sight. Or maybe the dirty air, the sewage we call water, asbestos houses, no jobs, no education, and the hate which is all in fortune's war, which is what kills my people, body and soul, whole a vessel. Um, I didn't finish my next one, but uh, here's what I've got so far. Uh, the poem is called Pain. Pain, that wholly annoying, itching, burning, sensibility destroying, teeth marked bite at the back of my mind, a mind of loss which looks upon us as a hungry man looks upon a rare steak. The fight that tells a man he's alive is what we see and do. Let what comes come at last. Okay, and finish that one. Thank you, Craig. Okay, our next poet is gonna be uh, uh, Professor Wallace. Uh, Professor Wallace. <laughs> They're all hiding in the wings. Okay, uh, our next our next poet is gonna be uh, uh, Sir William. Okay, now I'm good with the program. <laughs> all right. Good evening. Call this one Blinded by Love. It's a new one I wrote. Blinded by Love. You're sweeter than honey, I wish you were mine. But you have a guy, so I ran out of time. You may, be, you may have a guy, but he can't stop me from dreaming of us being meant to be. I won't let him get to me. I'll keep this love inside for a little while. I'll always dream of you. A tear falls from my face, and I let out a sigh. 
My heart is broken, but not for so long, so I guess this means goodbye. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no wonder he cut, it took a little while to get here. That's Sir William Smokey Robinson II. <laughs> a little smoke there. <laughs> All right. Uh, next uh, poet is going to be uh, Donald Thomas. Uh, this is uh, Professor Wallace. All right, there, Professor. Yes, good evening. My poem is called What's True. Okay. What's true to me, what's true to you, what's true to the game is a situated crew. We never lose, because we understand who, who we are. We also understand that the kingdom to come is not far. Stop us, please, you couldn't do that with bars. We got war, war wounds and scars too. What's true to me, what's true to DT, is players as old and professors as new. I mean, we about like to take this to a whole nother level. Yeah, sometimes from the left creeps the devil. To the fore goes the pedal, metal sparks in the dark in my city. I mean, there's thugs that show no pity. Man, they trying to obtain that pretty penny, root of all evil. Even Knievel couldn't hang where I stand, the land of the so-called free. What's true to me is the white dream, the supreme scheme to work to, no, the supreme scheme to work the prophecy for 6,000 years. Our ears to open, are open to what's true. The spear, 360 degrees of gain. The year 2G, quote unquote, hereafter, after here, what's true to me is building slash engineer. My, Chris, my, it's all crystal clear. My career to shift in gear. Me, a master architect for God, the supreme creator of the hemisphere. My atmosphere, everybody trying to be a cashier. Or trying to get a glimpse of this premier situated frontier, but they're really insincere, so they fall to the scripture's wayside. The silent cries due to the worldwide unsatisfied Jekyll and Hyde, the devil switches and disguising himself too. What's true, what's true, what's true. Okay. My second one, my second one is about a man who was a slave. I was born to save parents in 1759. No, no, 1795. As you can see, some people think that I became the most famous slave of my time. I was born from so master to master more than one time. Because around this era of slavery, being black was a crime. I'm sure they didn't know that around 1784, I was sent to the North, which became a fatal freedom blow. Face to face would be crazy when in this case it's the devil. But I mean, that's the only way to reach the free level. But not with metal, with my brains, because I filed suits and suit them to break my physical chains. Nothing changed, because he's the God of all lies. Man, he even misspelled names to keep me in ties. Now look at me, can't you see the fire in my eyes? I want to be free, but I want my freedom legalized. No need to apologize, even though that would be right. Because if you don't give it, I'm going to take my birthright. That around 1859, 1857, me and my family became free overnight. Yeah, I became the property of a dear friend, but this is where my slavery just had to end. Now, I don't think I'm some superman. I just did what was right, and this I recommend. Dred Scott, 18, no, no. Yeah, 1795 to 1858. Thank you. All right. Okay, our next poet is going to be uh, Ed Herring. Uh, 
He's published. Uh, Ed's going to come up and do uh, some poetry for you. So it's his first time. Let's give him a great round of applause. Thank you very much. Um, I do have a book of poetry published called Pruning to Shape. A great deal of it is uh, garden and landscaping imagery. Uh, the first poem I'll read is called Clouds. It's very simplistic. I hope it says something to you. I cannot see it out there on a chilling cloud, no direction to ever get there again. But as science is, this too a mighty image that dissipates like a child almost touching cotton candy. It's out there, but I can't see it. Ruminating, sexually active, but ruining my first night performance. Applause, but applause for nothing, resounds through the distance up to the clouds, fondling me with cactus like understanding. I just can't see it. Thank you. Thank you. The next one's called The Exception. Uh, this is a true story. I grew up in Missouri, Fulton, Missouri. Uh, Winston Churchill gave the Iron Curtain speech there. That's our claim to fame, other than my novel, which is now out, called uh, That Fine Inability to Speak. And uh, there was a deaf school there, and they, I was in the Baptist church, and they would come to the Baptist church, and we would sign the sermon for them. And they had uh, a man named Mr. Bach, he was about 17 or 16, and uh, he was an epileptic. He suffered from epilepsy, and uh, so that'll help give a little background. The exception. There were, there were the usual jokes and bad taste, but the athletic fact remained. When the team of deaf school basketballers were scheduled to play as, the waves parted. They didn't really have a team those days, just old Mule Murphy at the fulcrum and it was a sight to see him wheeling down court an Inkabot of sorts with a seven foot one spastic frame trying desperately to coordinate his oversized gams and arms comprised of ladder-like extensions. From out in the gym, he always looked confused and although we knew he couldn't hear us, we would cheer him on in spite of our school spirit. They say the scouts came from all corners of the state and that great things lay ahead for Mule as a sort of one-man team. He'd gain momentum as some midget would feed in the ball and nothing impeded his forward motion of wet cowlick and clodhoppers. He'd see the wall mat coming and dunk the plaything into the miniature hoop and predictably plow into the wall like one punch drunk. These necessary collisions weren't good for Mule's head didn't need any adversity. We loved Mule's sad eyes and ways, and as with any lover, we'd forget his flaw. Once we entered Mule's ribcage, it came upon us like lightning, and our guts split and searing pain wreathed through our collective heads. We would fall to the well-swept court of varnish and flail about, and the ref would try in vain to hold our giant self down and conquer, conquer us. Specialists had been paid by the school to correct the uncorrectable. Those who were fortunate enough, though, to stand over him had the bad's best seats. They claimed that Mule's, math, Mule's mouth became a vortex of grunting, as though the first words might come. His tongue would take the worst of the beating, and the school kept on a, a one-man team, 24-hour duty, simply to shove that special tongue back in. Once it would be over, his mammoth buttocks and soaking wet green gym shorts rolled gently with his breathing on the floor. He was again a baby who had been allowed his tantrum, which we all grew up envying. And as we grew older and our parents explained the nature of epilepsy and our limitations, we just bite our tongue and see our blood spill onto the only home, the court we knew. We saw those city men's promises sail out the window when he died at 18. They hung giant black wreaths on every fence post around the giant fort, foreign complex. The, o, the obituary read, quote, here was a Caesar, when comes such another, and we died a bit with the school. 
a lot of old women who never attended a game gossiped he was better off out of his klutzy misery. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. All right, give him a round of applause there. Okay, our uh, next poet is going to be um, uh, Donald Thomas. Let's give uh, brother Donald Thomas a round of applause there. The poem I chose to write is called Life. Social commentators label us endangered species. Homicide rates increases a divine place is needed. I realize that we've been cheated and I hate to be defeated and deleted. I, and I hate to be defeated and deleted from existence visualizing my position. Transformation taking place, the younger souls was made to rule. So your potential is a tool, so baby boo, don't be a fool. C consequences shaped in anger, putting hot ones in the chamber. N now you on the run from danger from some strangers trying to hang you. So don't attempt to be a G if you can't handle all the heat. Bring an ammo when I speak, so light the candle as I creep. To my destination with the motivation to perfection. True confection, true confessions of my sin as I begin to get connected with God. Thank you. Okay, our next poet is going to be uh, Ed McCray. All right, All right Ed McCray. First of all, my poems are very short, so I'd like to do a couple. The first one is entitled, Back It Up. Give me back my back street. Step aside when I'm on my side street, unless you're on my side. I will help you navigate your dark and dangerous back alleys. If you will help me navigate my highways and byways, then together we will cross over all the avenues of mistrust and intolerance and groove on down the boulevard of respect and understanding. The second one is entitled, God Is. God is so ethereal, so surreal, so far, so near. God is so super mundane, so metaphysical. God is so cyclical, so linear, so sunshine, so total. God is so atypical, so uncategorical, so super, so natural. God is. <laughs> All right. Our next poet uh, is going to be uh, Aaliyah D. Galloway. Uh, this sister is heavy. Let's give her a great round of applause. I'm going to do two pieces. And um, the first piece is called uh, Still Black. It's about a beautiful people separated within itself. Ultimately, it's about uh, what's inside our hearts. We be black in many shades. We be black in many, many shades. We be black in many shades, yet 
we still be black. Why I gotta feel your superior vibe? Just cause you're black on the light side? Why we gotta be splitting up our people when we should be unifying, undenying our brothers and our sisters? It ain't easy being of color. They say the term people of color covers a wide spectrum of beings. But these beings don't wanna be down with us. They're too busy looking down on us in the people of color line saying, at least we're not Negro. At least we're not colored. At least we're not black. At least we're not African American. And don't you know all those references are kind? Politically correct in their mind, yet they still don't want to claim us in the people of color line. And because life ain't easy, some of us want to do the skin color slide. Afraid of a shade or race, they want to run and hide, but you see, I never could pass, never thought of passing, just wanted my black to be in while society kept telling me it was out. Not in style, not in fashion, and all the while I was growing into myself, learning to accept myself, my big lips, my sometimes kinky hair, and my soulful style is what makes me and that's okay because people pay to achieve attributes that are naturally mine though some may deny the cosmetic surgery that manipulates theirs to look more like mine and don't you know they still don't want to claim us in the people of color line there is no ethnic group that wants to be mistaken for black but we sure will try and mix ourselves in other ethnic lines in an attempt to get by thinking it will raise our self-worth from low to high don't mind having a piece of their culture cause some of us don't want to be ain't proud to be but we better be down unifying proud and undenying instead of sliding to the lighter side cause in the end with one drop we still be black in the end with one drop we still be black in the end, with one drop, we still be black. And I'd be proud, and I am proud out loud, unifying and undenying. Ain't no shame in a people's pride. What we are is inside our hearts and our minds. Inside our hearts and our minds. OK, my next piece is. Um, called um, Looking Out for Little Man. Girlfriend, girlfriend, you better love your child. He's outside late night running wild. The boy will grow into a man at some time or other unless he meets his demise living that street life like his brother who died an untimely death in the arms of a stranger. You better recognize your issues, girl, and quickly become a rearranger of your life. I thought you would have learned something from the magnitude of that loss. This is a reenactment of the same drama. Are you sure you have the instinct to be a mama? My son told me that your son was packing, carrying a gun, standing on the corner with his pants sagging, and you knew all the time what little man was doing. I feel like I'm losing a child because he's closer to me now than he is to you, and you don't even recognize your cries for his cries for your love. He says you don't care, girl. Little man needs a hug. Instead of loving, you're cussing little man out, telling him to go on and go, just leave his keys and close your door. That's some crazy stuff to say to your only living son especially if you're trying to steer him away from the life that took the other one. You tell him to get out of your sight. You want some privacy, you're having company tonight. So you send him to my house for something to eat. You send him to my house for, to go to sleep. You send him to my house for the duration of your vacation that you say is for a peace of mind. But what kind of peace of mind do you think you deserve when your first priority is the last word to ever leave your lips? And that usually happens when you say, I'm disrespecting your mother with. You say, mind your own business. This is my child. So damn, what if he's running wild? You better get your own business in order to stay out of mind. This ain't the 70s and this ain't no tribe. But I thought we were family and I thought we were friends. I remember when you were evicted, I took you in. Let you treat my house just as if it were yours. You didn't even respect that you didn't understand. It was a tribal sisterhood that moved me to let you in. I go to work every day, yet I found the time to find you a place to stay. Rented a U-Haul to move you in. Now your son tells me you're close to eviction again. You see, little man's working because his mama don't. 
It ain't cause she can't, it's cause she won't. Well girl, I thought it was bad luck that brought you down, but it's laziness and ignorance that crowned you the clown of clowns, and I don't know what more I can do. So I decided I lay the truth on you, and maybe we'll never be friends again, but I'll always look out for little man. Thank you. Told you that sister was heavy. Okay, uh, next poet is gonna be uh, Carlos Ramirez. All right. I'd like to share some uh, songs I've set to poems by Langston Hughes. And first one is called Dreams. Hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly hold fast to dreams for when dreams go life is a barren field frozen with snow hold fast to dreams for if dreams die life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly hold fast to dreams for when dreams go life is a barren field frozen with snow Um, some years ago, I guess in the early 70s, I came upon Langston Hughes's poetry in the uh, San Jose Public Library. And that first poem I read out of an anthology of his, of his poems was called I'm Still Here, and it's coming to me right now. Very short, and such a profound and beautiful poem. And I've set some music to the poem. And so here's the sung version of it. The little preamble goes, appreciate the effort, appreciate the struggle, appreciate everything you've been through. Langston Hughes once wrote it down. I've been scarred and battered, my hopes the wind unscattered. Snow is frizz me, sun has baked me. Looks like between them they didn't try to make me. Stop laughing, stop loving, stop living. But I don't care, I'm still here. I've been scarred and battered, my hopes the wind unscattered. Snow is frizz me, sun has baked me. Me. Looks like between them they didn't try to make me stop laughing, stop loving, stop living. But I don't care, I'm still here. I don't care, I'm still here. I don't care, I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> so many beautiful poems. Um, here's one I'm inspired to sing right now. It's called Daybreak in Alabama. Who knows you know that poem? 
When I get to be a composer I'm gonna write me some music about Daybreak in Alabama And I'm gonna put the prettiest songs in it Rising out of the ground like a swamp mist and falling out of heaven like soft dew I'm gonna put some tall trees in it and the scent of pine needles and the smell of red clay after rain and long red necks and poppy colored faces and big brown arms and the field daisy eyes of black and white black white black people and I'm gonna put white hands and black hands and brown and yellow hands and red clay earth hands in it Touching everybody with kind fingers And touching everything as natural as do In that dawn of music When I get to be a composer And write about daybreak in Alabama Let's give them another great round of applause for that. All right. All right. Okay, our next poet is going to be, um, uh, this is a gifted young brother here. Let's give him a great round of applause. Uh, Jesse. All right. Jesse Riley. Give it up. Good evening. This first poem I'm going to read to you is called As I'm in Love. Words flow from the tip of my pen like ejaculatory juices in my moments of spiritual climax. Great words of birth, many sentences of growth, knowing paragraphs of wisdom spread all over like fairy dust, preparing the sensation of a passionate kiss with the creation of a few letters alphabetically aligned. Joining my thoughts together with written communication like marrying my heart to my soul mates. Innocent nouns, subjects, predicates, and verbs combined to express my divinity. Painting my confusions, I am Picasso, Matisse, Da Vinci. Forgotten songs of a lover are remembered with the unforgettable sound of heartbeats put to a page. And La 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 vibes produce the short story of intense lovemaking above a tiny river in Italy. Visions of the estimated sands of time are exacted with statements of infinity prolonged and guitar licks provide my jazz pen with the opportunity to cry out melodies of powerful life brought forth through faith, spirit, and imagination. 
and I have battled with self to provide the atmosphere with many breathing words and life words and love sentences and intimate portraits of divine intervention. And adventurous passions have safeguarded my heart, allow me words of prepared places in heaven and an elegant chair next to God. And I express specifically hope and self and an eternal message of never giving up, always realizing one's divineness. And so, my ejaculatory juices in my moments of climax are as my flowing words of magic as they exit my pen. Thank you. Thank you. This uh, final piece, I, uh, I read it last week, and uh, it was requested that I read it again, so I'll go and do that now. Uh, it's called my son's name is Compromise. Slam! Slam! Who I am, contaminated. I made it through the wastelands, wasting time wading through the sands. Quick pollution of the mind exhaust my intellectual resources and I resort to mental violence. Ejaculate to the thought of hate and have intercourse with silence. Got her pregnant since my Jimmy was loud, but proud of the compromise we quietly provided. Never tried to hide it. The light was lighted. Always knew it was there because of how bright it was. How right it was. Black night, an opening eye, lashes painting the sky. I capture the wind and feed it to my child so he can fly. And his mother will breastfeed him with patience. He will suckle her nipple and gain wisdom of the moon, stars, and suns. For compromise, it's related to the magnificent art of constellations, creations of stellar concentration. I, his father, will take place in his maturation. His teacher will be God. My child will dwell in the midst of love itself, himself love, picking mind fruit of the tree of knowledge, reading the universe, dreaming himself to the fifth dimension, adding and subtracting, sweet and sour, my son is power, the sum of screams in peace, my son is P, is for peace. Slamming misconceptions down into the gutter, full of the clutter, tatter, lies, and deception, which evil discovered and brought to the forefront. But my son is a forerunner, four light years ahead of the others. I am a proud, doting daddy dearest, father to a Negro thought who inherited deep thoughts of fierceness. He will be the fiercest prophet of fearless prophetic hope in the midst of mind storms with deadly wind gusts of insanity and stress. And as he grows older, he will undress slowly the body of a great thought of his lonesome and pour endless amounts of life into her bosom. And my kid will make love and fill her body up with abstract sperm, relaxing her womb with, with his miraculous, miraculous word flow. Exercising his need for freedom, he won't have to take the route that I took. Compromise will reach into his thoughts, grab hold of the universe, and fly. Because I and his mother have instilled in my son the wisdom and knowledge of the moons, the stars, the suns, and the skies. My son's name is Compromise. Now it's, now it's time to break off into a little bit of Eddie Harris and Les McCann, trying to make it real compared to what? <laughs> and, uh, I told you, young brother's heavy. Okay, uh, this is another gifted uh, poet here. This gentleman here, I heard him a couple of times. Uh, uh, it's a really gifted. Uh, well, let's give a great round of applause to um, uh, Charles uh, 
Curtis Blackwell. Let's give it up for Brother Charles. All right. While attending a corporate party after the funeral, aroused by a quiver, silver thin to the golden touch, sliding about the crowded room with other faces full of facades. Words that echo from mind to steel, from heart to dirt. Let me harangue you with bone-cutting words of poetry that seek to jolt your wretched insides and slice your emotions in half until they bleed through the skin of your forbidden facade a mask less broken. Penetrate your concrete spirit and face you into a place where you have no other alternative other than to become real. Um, our next poet, uh, me and his sister, we go way back, uh, so let's give, she's also gifted, she can do it all, so, lady, here's a quadruple threat, uh, gifted, gifted lady. Uh, let's give, uh, Mary Booker a great round of applause, she's gonna come up with some poetry. Good evening. I shall read a poem I wrote called Voices in the Wind. Voices, voices. I hear voices in the wind of time, whirling, twirling, invading every corner of my mind. Our ancestors speak in voices loud and clear so that we would be sure to hear. Listen, 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 please. They speak of how it used to be, of our people proud and free. I hear voices. I hear voices on the wind of time, the middle passage. Listen, I hear them. Many are dying. Oh, how they wish to be free. Some are planting their bodies in the deep blue sea so their spirits again can roam free. Voices, voices in the wind of time. Anguish voices in troubled mind. Voices, voices whisper in my ear, trying to veil the consuming fear. Voices, voices, don't you hear? Listen, listen, as the wind blows, listen.
This poem I entitle Heritage. Africans, Africans, who arrived on these shores. African, Africans, where did all the black blood go? When more than 40 millions were dragged from Africa's shores. Are you trying to tell me that they simply disappeared and that you are a new breed produced by the Irish, the English, and the people who were already here? Why are so many of you ashamed to say, my blood clutched through your veins? You can't hide the features of my face by giving yourself another name. The next time you look into the mirror, tell me what do you see? Is there just a trace of Africa there showing you the image of me? It boggles my mind. How can you accept the Indian, the Irish, the English, and cast me aside? What did I ever do to you? I only wanted to nurture you. It was by their hands, the Irish, the English. Your African ancestors were brutalized. I do not ask you to hate or deny your Indian, Irish, or English background, but simply answer me this question. Where would you be today had I not been around? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. You're right again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Our next poet is going to be uh, Anita uh, Burton. Let's give her a great round of applause there. <laughs> I have to sing some Delphonics. Didn't I blow your mind this time? <laughs> Thank you. All right. Good evening. Uh, this is a biography on uh, Mary Cloud Bethune. And I put this together after reading poetry of Maya Angelou, Phenomenal Woman, her poem, and also Still I Rise. When I read Maya Angelou's poem, Phenomenal Woman, or Still I Rise, I think of Mary McLeod Bethune who was an activist, a visionary, a teacher, a phenomenal black American woman. She was born July 10th in 1875. As Maya Angelou states, out of the huts of history, shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear the tide. I rise, I rise. And rise she did, in spite of the limitations that history imposed on Mary McLeod Bethune, because of her physical African characteristics, her kinky textured hair, her full lips, her black complexion, and her wide nose that even black middle class Americans disesteemed, she saw herself as God's very own precious child, equal to any other in the human family. Mary McLeod Bethune lived, believed in herself and in God. She was the 15th of 17 children. She graduated from a Presbyterian boarding school in 1894. The school prepared the majority of its students to teach other black Americans whose slave heritage left them desperate for schooling. A teacher she was. She promoted opportunities for young people to obtain an education and employment. She taught them to assert their personal and organizational equality. She lifted, service to the, uh, she lifted service to others to an exalted high. Mary McLeod Bethune did not wait to exhale, she exhaled. In 1898, she married Albertus Bethune. They had one child, a son. Responding to the black community's need for education in 1904, she rented a house to launch the Daytona Educational and Industrial Institute. She had an understanding of people and persuasive powers, but in spite of her talents, it was more difficult for her to establish a school than it was for Booker T. Washington when he began the Tuskegee Institute, a private school in Tuskegee, Alabama. An entrepreneur, she sold sweet potato pies to raise money for her school. 
She had a vision, determination, and initiative. The school began with five little girls, a dollar and a half, and faith in God. According to tradition, she used dry good boxes for benches and charred splinters of burnt logs for pens and elderberry juice for ink. As time passed, Bethune School grew to a student body of several hundred students with three assistant teachers. The school became an important community resource and involved into what is now known as Bethune Cook College. An invisible woman, she was not. Her essence was exhibited as an extraordinary public figure. With the glaring shortcomings of the 1937's administration civil rights record, she flatly stated time and time again that black citizens could not be satisfied or complacent. In 1935, Bethune founded and served as the first president to the National Council of Negro Women, an organization still in existence today. From 1936 to 1944, she was, the, she was the director of the National Youth Administration and served as a special advisor to Franklin Roosevelt and had a highly visible friendship with Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt. Bethune fine-tuned her leadership to the racial climate in which she lived. Recently, she along with Frederick Douglass, W.B. Du Bois, and Martin Luther King were deemed as one of the most influential black Americans in American history. Mary McLeod Bethune passed away in 1955. As Maya Angelou states in her poem, Phenomenal Woman, now you understand just why my head is not bowed. I don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. When you see me passing, it ought to make you proud. I say, because I'm a woman, phenomenally phenomenal woman. That's me. Y'all probably notice I've been smiling uh, and I keep looking over here. I got it. Yeah, we got to treasure our children. Yeah, this, this um, got a little son, uh, he's almost uh, two, uh, but, uh, well, no if, ands, or buts, but like, well, when my daughter was born, like, um, you know, she, uh, I'll never forget, it's forever etched in my mind and my heart, she crossed her arms and smiled at me. And I'll never forget that, like, I mean, I, I had never been in no delivery room, you know, and like, uh, they talk about cutting the cord, and I say, cut what cord? <laughs> cut out of here. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I stayed, uh, <laughs> I would like to, uh, my wife, they on the way up, uh, my son. Um, well, I count my blessings. I'm uh, first time married and the last time too, uh, forever married. And, uh, and then to be a first and second time father to have come full circle, have a son and daughter, you know, that's a wonderful feeling. And like, uh, we have to treasure our families and we have to come back in touch with our feelings, emotions, and affections. and. We have to, um, uh, it's like the Isley brothers say, Jasper Isley, Isley, Jasper Isley, join the caravan of love. We gotta get it together. I would like to de dedicate this poem to uh, my wife and my daughter and my son. And it's uh, simply just the way I love to say I love you. If I always seem to wanna hold your hands, it's only because I love you. Love walking together side by side with you, my love. If I hold you close to me, it's only because I want to stay warm as beautiful thoughts of the love we share keeps my heart smiling. If I whisper sweet things in your ears, it's only because I want to share my innermost treasured thoughts with you, only you, and you alone. It's just the way I love to say I love you. If my heart sends you roses and daffodils, tenderly picked straight from the gardens of love, just for you. If my eyes seem to be dreamy, I'm spellbound and so in love with you. If I whisper your name sweet and low, it's only because of the warmth I feel in my heart for you. Just a sincere and honest figure of expression, 
as I visualize all of the many beautiful and real qualities in you, lovely lady, lovely one, my only one. True love reigns with tears of joy, so let me kiss yours forever and always. So straight from my heart, let your love shine straight at my heart, and you'll see it's just the way I love to say I love you. Thank you. What do you want to say there, Pretty? You want to say something? Huh? David didn't want to say nothing now. Okay. That's all right. Okay, our next poet. Uh, Uh, oh, you want to take it? Okay, we're gonna take a, a five-minute intermission and come back with you with some heavy slamming poetry. Okay, all right. Y'all come back now. Don't go away. Patrick, you have Yeah. Wizard of Oz. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I come back by the yellow brick road. All right, he's on down the road. <laughs> Okay, you come on in and sit down. Oh, that's fine. Ah, yeah, okay, we're going to start. We've only got a little while to go. We've got a few more poets to get through to enjoy. Yes, come on over. We haven't started yet. Come on, Precious. Stand up, baby. But we shall. Is everybody having a good time so far? Yeah. Okay. Before we start the second half, I wanted to take this opportunity to present uh, a little certificate of appreciation to Mr. Larry Ware, who has been doing this event for 10 years. It's a, um, a labor of love. He always uh, comes through for us. Um, uh, he does, he gets all the poets together, he arranges the food, and um, this is a special time every year for us uh, here in Bayview Hunters Point to get our poets together and share the art of the spoken word. So I, this is a certificate for him, and at the end of this recital, we're going to have a nice spread of food and a nice cake that's also honoring the 10th Annual uh, Poetry Recital and Larry Ware. So on the certificate of appreciation, this is presented to Larry Ware in appreciation for your decade of work on the poetry recitals at the Bayview Wadden Library from Linda Brooks Burton and the staff of the Bay Bayview Wadden Library. That's for you. Thank you. And let the show go on. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. I, I thank you. It's uh, indeed an honor and a pleasure to uh, receive this uh, award, this recognition. I, I greatly appreciate it, and uh, I thank you, and I thank you. It, it's about us. Like, you all, we all make this what it is, you know, and, and uh, that's the beauty of it. And to see uh, so many of you out tonight, like, uh, it, it's, uh, it, 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 it deeply touches me. So we're going to, again, thank you, and we're going to continue with the program. Um, I'm going to call up um, our next poet, um, Gail Mitchell. Let's give her a great round of applause. poem for my daughter. She's making bread using a recipe from a cookbook that used to belong to her great-grandmother. Washing greens in the sink for Sunday dinner. She's building a bridge asking her ancestors for guidance. Learning the old ways. She wears old suits from the 40s that her grandmother wore in college and shirts from the 70s. She's mixing it up, cross-pollinating finding her own way, moving within herself. She has closed the door on childhood and reached for an apple on the highest branch. 
I watch from a distance the beginning of a new adventure, and a new dawn awaits her footsteps. She has begun to change form gracefully, rising like the bread in the bowl filling the room. She stands at the foot of my bed, looks at me and I at her. We are seeing each other with new eyes. She is studying my gaze. I am moving within my skin, shifting the position of my legs, telling her what I know to be truth. She is growing beyond the frame, moving in another orbit. I am stepping back, taking in the dimensions, not telling, not asking, listening, hearing, feeling air take shape, find a new form. She is pushing gently, trying to find the way to tell me she is moving in new ways, feeling the smallness of her room, wanting to stretch and move beyond the limits she has lived in. She's trying to find the way to say, I need space. This is like a small cage, and I've grown beyond the confines of your hopes and dreams. I've moved beyond your struggles and agreements. I've imagined a different future. The bread rises in the bowl, and she is ready to knead it again, ready to leave, ready to flow, ready to rise, ready to go. That's for Nova Wilson, my daughter. And this poem, I truly believe, was a gift. It's called Sightings of Angels. There have been sightings of angels, often glimpsed in the half dark, rescuing some soul when he's cashed in all his chips and is just blowing that one note that threatens to break into something special. There are moments when Michael the Archangel has been seen, wings back, tapping his fingers, lingering over Beale Street, lingering over someone with a clarinet who's playing dragon tunes. And he's there to urge him on, to encourage him to the edge and on into ecstasy, lost in the glory of just blowing because it feels so damn good. And every Christmas, and often in the fall when it would get cold and crisp outside, Mahalia Jackson could be heard closing up the stud down on Folsom, singing and shouting, hallelujah, singing and shouting, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And those boys, soon to be men, heard it and felt it as last call was heard one more time. Angels have been seen at midday in the Fillmore when it was all black. No, it hadn't stopped being colored yet. Men with their straw hats and fine tan leather shoes and suits so crisp they almost shouted at you. The creases were that sharp. There was an angel down there, Jack. Sometimes she'd be coming out the beauty parlor, hair all done up in a press and curl, ready for Saturday night. Or maybe just go into the bowling alley where she'd meet the girls hanging out for the evening. And many is the night that some poor fool spent his rent money at the club Long Island down on 3rd Street. There's angels have often been seen in broad daylight, wearing red lipstick, red nails, and dressed to the nines. Girl knew she was looking good. And Billy used to sing right over there on Fillmore Street at the Plantation Club, and Lord, ooh, she could make it break down. There were clubs up and down the street, house parties with chili and crackers and home brew, dip and potato chips, and a little girl who watched the grown-ups get silly. They'd throw a nickel, a dime, or a quarter her way, and a quarter in those days was some big money. It could buy you five candy bars or a Coke and a bag of chips. These angel sightings got less and less, but sometime when the music was well, you know, it could take you higher than weed, higher than booze, higher than 
Well, the music could take you there. There'd be Carlos Santana, head back, eyes closed, just playing the hell out of that guitar. Everything is coming my way. Everything is coming my way. And you'd look up, and there'd be tears. Or Janice would shout, baby, 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 welcome back home. Or Jimmy would play your spine as Voodoo Child would cook. Then there was the day Harvey Milk and Moscone got shot. So many of us took to the streets that night. We marched from Castro Street to City Hall. Joan Baez sang, and I could swear over my shoulder, away to the rear, a bit of wing. Just the other day, I was listening to Minnie Ripperton, and I felt a tear escape down my cheek. As I reached up to wipe it away, if not six feet, at the foot of the dining room table, an angel seemed to blur on the edge of my vision. As my head hit the pillow, just before I said goodnight to my children, I heard a voice as clear as day. Must have been someone or something reminding me to pray. Thank you. Thank you. Our next poet is going to be uh, Bill Tolliver. Let's give Bill Tolliver a great round of applause. Good evening. <clears throat> I am uh, medical examiner's investigator here in San Francisco, also known as the coroner. And I find myself in situations that are extremely um, painful for people who experience sudden death, people who I walk in pools of grief. I have to put that grief somewhere else. I have to put that identification somewhere else. I have to put that empathy somewhere else so that I can do my job. And as I read newspapers and I look about the city and I look about the other cities and I've traveled places where I have somehow identified with pain because something in me wants to heal that. So I have written things about Kosovo. I've written things about the Tenderloin. I've written things about 6th Street. I've written things about uh, Cold War. And I'd like to read a couple of things that I've written. And these are my first writings. I just had to just take it out of here and put it over here. And I'd like to read Kosovo because I think war is one of the most selfish things a human being can do to another. This is Kosovo. Garden of Eden, spirit walking naked, no one knew. Forbidden places not hidden, why not go there? I see myself naked. I see myself before I see you. I am that you're not. I know I'm not supposed to. Voices in my head, my heart, my soul, a voice, one voice, not mine. Frantic leaving, nothing to take, save her. Her, mine, not hers, mine. Begat, begot, Cain, Abel, where'd they come from? Voices, voices, one voice in my soul. Kill him, kill him, I'm dying, I think. Kill me, kill her, kill everything. I'm dying, leave nothing for them. Beget, begot, kill, kill. Time now, disciples said, he was, he is. Cross my heart, hope to die. Kill, kill, hanging on a cross. Hanging crosswise on a stick. Holy, holy, make a sign, rub a tummy, have a war. Holy, holy, voices, voices in my head, in my soul. No way, no way, my way, any way. No, mine, mine, mine. Give me that land, give me that country, give me that mine. Let go, it's mine. Let go, get out, it's mine. Get out, that's mine. Get out, your mine. Begat, begot, Cain, Abel, kill, kill. Careful, don't track blood in the Garden of Eden. God will kill you. These are real experiences. 
meeting John Coltrane. It was as if he were a portal between here and the universe, that he traveled there and come back as a testament. One could see the depth of the universe in his eyes if he let you in. You'd see galaxies, timeless, limitless galaxies within such a gentle soul. Having the place from which it came and brought with it from that place the quiet power of affirmation. Doubt should now, no longer in you reside once you've met his eye. You meet silence in you that which is akin to all. Just before birth, just after death, that place where you begin to hear again the only real sound, creation. This is uh, for a young man that, it wasn't one of my cases, but I happened to read where a young black man went down in, on Hayes Street, I believe, was chased down and gunned down. And as I read the history, I, uh, I felt this. And as we're all children, we're all running around and playing and having a good time and everything is like fast and we're moving and going. And I wrote, Mama, I ain't supposed to be running like this. I rounded second base, that's what we called it, just a garbage can top in the dirt, a brick for third, and Tommy's jacket for home base. Mostly we used Tommy's foot for first. We could all run, yelling, screaming, screaming, yelling, running, running through the streets, chasing, being chased, good times, school days, feeling good, running the streets, the streets. Fast cars, fast money, girls, gonna get me some, gonna get me some, we bad, we cool, smoking, shooting, doomsday all day, green potential, Lincoln's, Jefferson's, Grant's, right on, you, I know, you know me, it's all about me. All about me, I take what I want, bitch, tramp, ho. I've been running the streets to game, beat you down, threw down on your ass, punk. I take what's mine, punk, chump. Don't let me catch your punk ass out of pocket. No, man, no, man, it ain't got to go down like this. I'm sorry, man, look, check this out. No, man, no, man, you ain't got to do this. Check what you want here, man, this is all I got, oh, shit, man. Police report number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The victim was seen running south on Maple Street with three subjects in pursuit. The victim was witnessed previously at the corner of Elm and Maple Streets, apparently pleading for his life before trying to escape his assailants. The three subjects running with weapons in hand outran the subject, caught him and threw him to the ground. The subject on his back, hands together in prayer-like fashion, according to witnesses, was pleading for mercy. The assailants fired their weapons point blank at the victim, then ran from the scene. After the assailants ran from the scene, the witness approached the subject, who though mortally wounded, was talking as if in conversation. It was reported by the witness that the subject said, Mama, I ain't supposed to be running like this. <laughs> then died of multiple gunshot wounds. <laughs> I call this Helter Skelter Tenderloin USA. Blood slick streets, footprints leading to every door across sidewalks littered, littered with dreams eaten by nightmares. Demon-like gargoyles posing as human in street clothes, proffering their wares. Skeleton-like hands holding fair exchange reach out to buy an hour of life, a vacation. Staring hollow eyes, last hope's dying spark, people mere coat racks moving about this garment district. Detached, for sale, any price, free. Souls spilling over from refuse cans, discarded. Scavengers sorting through them to find someone to wear. Every place downhill, a mall where no spirit should go. Okay, our next poet is gonna be September Rose. What a beautiful name. Let's give, it up. Let's give her a great round of applause. How y'all doing? Right. That's good. I'm gonna do a poem that doesn't have a title. In fact, I'm gonna do two poems. I feel like 
dying and crying. Any emotional sensation breaking down from the highest elevation. I can't concentrate. I need my second person. I miss me. I jump into that invisible door inside the ocean stars and become the beautiful planet called Mars, making love to the space around me. I'm lost. I feel like I'm falling off of a mountain of a thousand echoes of darkness. Scream! Me black honey of yellow moons. Collide as we grow with mellow tunes. Collide as we grow with mellow tunes. Let me dark shadows bloom. Overlapping my mind statement. Taking your mind out of this state called misplacement. I quickly glance at my shadow behind me. Wow. I'm gonna do a short, short one. I hope I get it right. Um, this one has no title either. I can see you, you can't see me. I see through you, you're like plastic to me. Synthetic, genetic, pathetic, and weak. Plastic people melts when life turns up the heat. I feel you lurking in my shadows, possessed with hate and jealousy, waiting for the chance to get the best of me. But you see, you need a, you're not even a threat to me. You a joke in my comedy, which always leads to tragedy. Clueless, Clueless loop. <sighs> Clueless and lame. Useless to yourself. And damn, that's a shame. Thank you. Um, this uh, next poet here, me and this brother, we go way back, uh, way back. And um, he's going to be uh, leaving the Bay Area, so uh, we're going to miss him. But uh, it's been a great pleasure. Uh, he's been in uh, all but one of the recitals here. And uh, that's my buddy here. Uh, can't go wrong with a name like Rudolph Valentino Breland, so let's give it up for Rudolph Valentino, the original. He's going off to see the wizard. You the man. Yeah, I've been privileged to be part of this for the 10 years, and I'm really going to miss it. I'm going back to Kansas City, Kansas, and it's been 25 great years and inspirational years of learning a lot of things here in the Bay Area and meeting a lot of inspirational people. Um, first poem I'm going to read is uh, really from one of the groups that I got involved with at City College, and which really taught me how to begin to share my poetry by reading, which is called Poetry for the People. Poetry for the People. Hunger lies within the eye, from deep inside the body cry. There is a need to be free. Some words of nourishment 
to give the meaning of life encouragement. Poetry for the people is healthy and legal. Energy which harmonizes the heart. Votes which sparks and awaken the mind. It's long overdue and about time. It's poetry for the people. Words to hear, the words of truth, to let the mind loose. Eat on the timely beat, taste and feel the poetry of you and me and all the people. Uh, next poem I'm going to read is uh, called Save the Wells, which is also the name of uh, this uh, printmaking uh, project which I did about uh, four or five years ago. And also I will be giving away this and the poem and a random drawing later on. Uh, save the Wells. Save the Wells in the sky. Save the Wells. Save the Wells. Mirrors upon the wall call out. Listen, people, save the whales. Don't let them die. Whales cry for survival. Whales for right to live. They have a right to live, too. Save the whales. Whales come to the shores of America, hoping for some humanity and for some care in the heart. Oil spills that are deadly thrills. Poison water taking the whales from their home. Whales coming to shore because they cannot breathe no more. Save the wells as you save yourself. Save the wells, well high in the sky, they want to survive. Make a fearful cry. Save the wells as well as save the children and save yourself. What goes around comes around. What goes down will later come and pour upon you and surround you. Save the wells as well as save your life. Um, this is a, a favorite of many people, which I've have read several times, and also I frame this and going to also give this way in a uh, random drawing. Zip in, zip out. <laughs> zip in, zip out. Zip in, zip out. People moving about. Zip in, zip out. Zip in, zip out. People com communicating, relating. Drop the mail into the slot, move on to the next box. Entering, receiving. Delivering and receiving. Zip in, zip out, zip out, zip in. Zip in, zip out. Down the street, through the hallways, answering questions, giving out directions. In and out of doors and down the hallways. Mails of many sides and forms. Samples in magazines, partials and letters. Zip in, zip out, zip out, zip in. Names, places and numbers move up and down and all about. No such number, no one living here anymore. That dressy unknown, move, left, no address, vacation hold, resume delivery, zip in, zip out, zip out, zip in, COD, postage due, special delivery, express delivery, zip in, zip out, zip out, zip in, zip in, zip out, zip out, zip in, zipping through the zip zone, zipping through the zone, zipping, zipping, zipping through buildings, zipping through hallways, zipping through house, zipping till I'm all zipped out. Okay, I'd like to uh, end with this poem here. Uh, we, we, a family tree. We are us and you are me because we are a family tree. Keeping the roots growing outward and outward. Letting the trunk expand out, letting us express what we're all about. We are a family tree branching out as a family, branching out as a vessel of existing in the streams of life, keeping touch from all directions, mother, father, and children, keeping affection alive, desires burning and weep inside, lifting our self-esteem to our main goals and dreams, keeping the foundation and break to earth, up from the past into the present and to the future, from generation to generation, letting us know what we are all about and where we can be and where we are headed. Letting the spirit in our hearts shine out as a light everlasting. We are family, we are neighbor of blood, nourishing us together as a community. We turn the key to touch and to open the door, to reach out and to hold, to not to let go. 
We are a family tree of unity. We are a monument of living that we are one and we are all. We are a family, a house that has now become a home. We are a tree, together we stand, and apart we can fall. And our strength is our character by seeing with our heart and feeling with our soul and being a family tree. Thank you. Got my other little one with me. It's Larry Jr. here. Right. Okay. Hi, Junior. Okay. Where's Stella? Uh, Stella, she's right over there. Uh, she was there. Uh, just prepared the food. She got uh, Oh, yeah. Uh, Malik uh, Senna Ferry. Uh, Fer he's going to come up and do a poem. So let's give the brother a great round of applause there. And again, Peace. I'm gonna just do a little poem that I wrote when I was in Kenya, and uh, it was kind of I was involved in a riot there and uh, me and some friends. I went there by myself and I met some friends and we were walking down the street and the army just came and then it flashed in my head. It flashed in my head a lot of the wars. You know, my, my stepfather, he was in the war and I've been affected by wars all my life. And now we stand here today with wars on our streets. So. I'm gonna come with this one. <clears throat> this one is called America's Ingredient. I don't really read poetry that much, I just write, but here we go. <clears throat> Words, objects, names, letters, high-priced sweaters, mink feathers, genuine leathers, 38 Berettas, Top notches, gold watches, rock diamonds, judges lying, mind blinding, kids crying. A White House market on the White House carpet. Street drugs sold out of ghetto supermarkets. Liquor stores, wicked whores, glorifying crime, wasting time, lacking sense. Neighborhood jacking prints. Cause being a Negro is just a cinch. A people killed, a nation built, a father's guilt from the white man's filth. For being black, death is immediate. Yes, this is America's ingredient. Thank you. Um, I, um, again, as I said, like uh, the most important thing to me is that everybody gets on this videotape, so uh, we have about uh, 15 minutes to go. So I want to make sure everybody's covered, so uh, it's important to me and it's, that everybody's on here. It's a family here. Um, uh, let me see. Joseph Jacko? Jaco. Jaco, excuse me, brother. Let's give it up for Joseph Jaco. This is going to take a little time. I don't know whether I should wait until everybody else finishes or not. But with what I have to read, I have music also to go along with it. Without it, it would really be incomplete. So if the music gets a little heavy, 
Listen to the words I speak. Don't you remember the moments you had when your thoughts were so beautiful you could have drawn a picture or wrote a poem or lyrics to a song that would have influenced society for centuries to come? The value of your mind is as large as life. Allow your heart to control your direction and explore the beauty if you like what you see, I'm here. Share that with me. The multitude of life means we. Yes, I want to know how deep your thoughts and visions go. Open your mind, let me in. This mix is destined to begin. Your inner and outer beauty I know your thoughts are plenty. I believe our years of union will and should be many. How many is many in my journal? For you and I, that is eternal. You are what I see that is destined. I want you to become a part of me. There is so much about life to be thankful for. When we cross-communicate our ideas, the blessing is the action combined with vision. We begin to create. Our senses is a mechanism to the brain, which is connected to energy, like what scientists call matter in the vast universe that continues to expand, which we are all so much a part of. How can we not react to such a powerful mix of elements and not feel compelled to contribute to the very existence of life? I find this impossible. And if you find yourself wondering why you have moments of stress, it is because you have not allowed yourself to keep up with the energy of your brain. This sometimes can be influenced by the pace of your surroundings, and that can have a devastating effect on your balance of content, which leads to strain and stress. So harness your thoughts and vision and dedicate your efforts towards your destiny. To be able to express my thoughts, it sometimes intoxicates me to a point of exhaustion or contentment satisfaction in either case. My motivation comes from within when realizing the things I know I must do to survive. Don't let life pass you by without fulfilling your destiny, even though we don't know to what point we will cease. The key is to keep yourself up to date and then you will always exist. That is called living life at a premium. Sometimes we all feel that we have been crossed by someone, but we must allow for the individualism of everyone. That is where our fortitude of understanding lets us continue to communicate and perhaps create together. That's how important it is to have to be able to succeed in so many things we pursue. Two people, it's very rare that they are ready, made for each other. You know what I mean? To accept all of each of our actions is impossible, it seems. And sometimes, familiarity breeds contempt. You may be familiar, but not understand. 
without communication being at hand. So don't be overexposed in this affair that exists. Leave some mystery so contempt will be a risk. Don't be afraid to examine a clue that has anything to do with me loving you. And when we can realize the time it takes to complete the kind of love our dreams make us seek. And then by chance you have that dream in sight, make sure you are determined in spite of some indifference you want to make it right. A fresh and rested mind is to the brain like a lubricant of oil to a machine. So take care and do not abuse your body with all the foreign substance provided by the devil. And we will prevail. The connection of the universe with solitude and sun, that's right, how beautiful. Way out here, but where? What we are is a part of something so big, we can't even say <laughs> how big is big. So we know it's a lot. Have I got that much for you? Every time we open our eyes, we never see the same thing twice. How nice. How much in our minds. Married for life with time. When that time is yours to share, evaluate it. And it will tell you time is not. It is fast, fast. Forever it will last. So keep on moving. But where? Out here is so nice. We never see the same thing twice. All living life of this planet is within a system. Can't you see how the reproduction of life brings about the evolution of change? Nothing stays the same. The elements that feed our lives is distributed in dimensions. So as, such as fish live in water, but must have oxygen to survive. We live on land and must have water to live. And when we cease, we all go back into the mass of our seas, which is the earth, which will be consumed by the universe. So allow yourself to expand, because there is no escape. Okay, uh, all right. Jesse uh, Wiley is going to introduce his sister here, so let's give her a great round of applause. Uh, <laughs> Kathy Wiley. Okay, Jess. I know y'all tired, but open them eyes back up. All y'all out there, come out the door. My sister about to get on the microphone. Wake up, everybody. All right, how y'all doing? How y'all doing? It's my sister right here, Kathy Wiley. Give it up, y'all, Kathy Wiley. All right, the title of my poem is called um, Reality. Many say I'm too young to understand anyway, but I can understand and comprehend any day. I can understand the hype, just like I can understand the pipe. I know what the sweet things are, just like I know what the street things are. I have always loved a piece of paper and a pen, so it's my writing to the end. I have always loved God and my mother, and together they created my brother. <laughs> and they must all know that there will never, ever, ever be another. I know who my sisters are. Nevertheless, I know who to despise. Never the best, I realize reality. Um, thank you. Okay. Okay, um, the second one is called Wondering. Sitting here wondering why we was put on this earth. I guess we was born to cry 
are just born to die. Don't you understand? We are torn. So why must we live to die? We've only suffered so much pain in so little time. Maybe life is a lesson or a mission or a confession. Either way, we're still left stressing. Is it to see how stupid we are? Can you see far? It's like a battle we can't win. It's like a war we can't fight. It's like we can see, but there is no sight. Can you see the light? Of course not, because there is none. Only night. Join me and take the flight. Where to? Who knows? But I got love for all my peoples, and it shows. Thank you. OK, our next quarter is going to be a Kakanja. Let's give Kakanja a great round of applause. Good evening. So I'll uh, keep it relatively brief. First thing I want to say, all the folks of African descent, please make going to the motherland a priority in your life. Uh, before a brand new VCR, get a used one. Before a brand new car, get a used one. The ticket to Africa will be round trip. Don't panic. You won't have to stay there if you don't want to. Yeah, but you yeah. owe it to yourself to go to the motherland. That's right. Believe me. This is untitled. How could we, the original humans, the noble race that brought civilization to planet Earth, how could we have become so full of self-hate that we view ourselves as people of little worth? You say it was the crazy white Arab and the dirty European, you shout. Yeah, the white thing is a beast, no doubt. But we must be painfully true. We must be on the level. Like my grandmother used to say to me, boy, tell the truth and shame the devil. Long before the European beasts emerged from their caves, we black Africans, among ourselves, had already begun to misbehave. As one people, we Africans started. As one people, we Africans stood. We obeyed God's laws. <laughs> yeah, it was all good. African women and men worked and played hand in hand. No kings, no slaves. You see, that was the original plan. Cooperation and respect guided all that we did. In the matriarchal, matrilineal time, women showed men the way. They taught us the peaceful way to raise children. And of course, they taught us how to pray. Yes, the goddess was a female, because all of us could see that life comes through the woman. No one in their right mind would say that God was a he. Yes, in the days of iration, we lived in harmony. Men listened to and protected the female. No hierarchy, no kings. No slaves, all of us were free. But something went wrong. How or why, I do not know. But we men stole power from our women. And that allowed the disease of greed and power to grow. You are either in a harmony or out of harmony. That is how the science flows. What goes around, comes around. You must reap what you sow. You are either being righteous or not. There is no middle ground, no matter what you have been programmed to think. Bad things will surely happen to you when you believe your own shit doesn't stink. 
Yes, the first mother, father, and family. Mathematics, medicine, music, pyramid building, all the sciences created through our deep understanding of spirit. All this black men and women to mankind gave. But our own man-made power and glory made us arrogant and set us up for what the Creator had brewing in those Caucasus Mountain caves. Thank you. Four minutes. Three minutes. Okay. Uh, who hasn't done some poetry yet that was on the program? Okay. Um, let's see, got enough for like each one of them to do one poem? Okay, uh, we have enough time for each one of you to do one poem, so um, Georgina, and then, what's your name? K.L. Hill? Okay, so come up uh, and uh, Darlene Roberts too, like, uh, come on up. Yeah. George Jacobs. Four minutes. Go ahead, Brown. The power of the skin. Hello. Sorry I missed your call. I'm at the Black Rep for the Poetic Call for Justice in support of Numia Awareness Week. But if, leave, if, but if you leave your name and your number, I'll return your call as soon as I get black. I'll be black to the power of the skin. I'm going black in time to remember when we was oppressed Negroes hungry to be free. When Bobby and Huey used to be Panthers, when Stokely and H. Rap Brown was Snick, when the bygots thought they were slick, when Jesse was the articulate rainbow coalition, when racism against po folk like me was the condition. Back then, the power of the skin gave us unity, and love was our ammunition. That's why I'm going black in time, to remember when the Urban League and the NAACP lobbied for me to be black, educated, employed, and free. Black when Third Good was the marshal, and Dr. Martin Luther King was the supreme drum major for justice, for just us, for just us who suffered from being black. Not, now I'm African American, but I'm turning black because I remember the power of the skin. I'll be black because the bigotry is a sin. I'll be black because I remember when James and his famous flame saying, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. So I'll be black in a crowd of colored folks because I died for the right to vote and I do declare my constitutional rights. So I'll be black in time for my 40 acres and a mule I'll be black because I ain't no fool. I'll be black to claim the victory. I'll be black enough to secede. I'll be black to collect my wealth. I'll be black to suit myself. I'll be black in time to set me near free. And I'll be black because I want to be. Thank you for calling. Look for me because I'll be black. Okay, our next poet is going to be, uh, uh, again, like we want to make sure everybody gets covered. so. Uh, uh, we're going to have to limit to one poem, also the branch has to close, so uh, our next poet is going to be uh, Darlene Roberts, so let's give her a round of applause. Ah! <laughs> 
during supper over a small victory that knows the living history of slaves who the blue represents the courage of the brave. The blues represents brainwashed people who finally learned to grow. When black found pride and unity, that's right, brothers and sisters, I am. The blues represents <coughs> African Americans fighting for freedom in our so called free land. Proud descendants of the first man. The blues, evolution, revolution, our destiny of truth, our legacy, our dynasty, kings and queens of the blues. To tell you the truth, the blues got its roots from the genius attributes of the first man. We are the dominant culture trapped in a stolen land. But we inherit the jungle rhythms that marks perfect time with the supreme and the divine spirit of the blues, spirit of the mystery, African blues. Born to bear witness to devastating hardships, the blues learned that more of a sound from slave ships that testifies to our undying pain. And that's why the mighty blues as our musical envoy, so we can musically be called when folk try to steal or destroy our musical legacy. <laughs> Truthfully, the blue is our baby, and it be witnessing Afrocentricity. Way down yonder, right down that old Tanaka Road, America's Negro musical legend of folk, where the first are them down home blues? Ha! <laughs> Fire cold folk out there paying their dues. Mm -hmm. Now our folk learn on that great getting up day <laughs> to sing and dance their cares away. And they describe their pain to the beat of the man, to the beat of the train, mm -hmm. and to the beat of them wagon wheels, chucking color folk to them cotton fields. The blues reveals the whips, the chains, the misery, the bigotry, all oh, America shame. The truth is contained deep inside the blue. Poet is going to be uh, K.L. Hill. Let's give K.L. Hill his first time round of applause there. All right. Thank you. I'm glad to be here tonight and uh, especially to hear the young people enjoy that very much. I'm going to read uh, a piece called Blues for Jeff. Last time I saw Jeff was back in 57, or it could have been 58. I can't remember anymore. He was sitting in his dusty gray 51 Chevy two-door streamline, parked in the red zone, across the street from the jazz workshop, with his alto sax in his lap, a gig bag, and a roughed up paperback copy of Finnegan's Wake on the dash and a bottle of Mountain Red between his feet. Just cause it's cheap don't mean it ain't no good, he'd say. Then he'd smile like he was smiling to himself. Then he'd pass the bottle. Jeff was sucking on a new reed, fingering some kind of figure around the circle of fifths on his alto without blowing in it. So he could play it in any key, he said so his fingers would learn what to do, and then he wouldn't have to think about it. And the keypads would open and close against the keyholes in a rhythm with a soft, percussive sound, making their own kind of music. Sometimes they call a tune in some weird key, he said, just to throw you off, just to see if you can wing it. And you gotta blow or else go right on back to the woodshed. 
Then he said he was just hanging around, killing time, resting up for a jam session at Bop City. I might be blowing all night, he said. Maybe I could line up a nice gig or maybe something else. You know what I mean? I don't know if I'll get to sit in, though, he said. There's too many names in town. I just caught Rollins at the workshop. He sure sounds rough, man, like playing half an idea and then just leave it hanging like taking fours with himself. Like he ought to quit playing in public, he said, till he gets it together. That was like before he found himself on the bridge. Just at, Jeff asked if I'd ever read Finnegan's Wake. I said I started reading it once, but then I put it down. I got a hard time reading stuff I don't understand, I said. Jeff said I should just read it and don't try to understand it. Just read it, man, he said. Absorb the words like the way you listen to music. And then he passed the bottle, and then reached back into the back seat with crap piled up to the windows, started digging through the clothes and books and old newspapers and downbeat magazines and fake books and manuscript paper, old broken reeds, tick-tock hamburger wrappers, empty beer bottles, empty wine bottles. And he pulled out a brand new Brew Moore record. You know the one with a weird purple snaky elephant trunk looking thing on the cover? Then he said, keep it, man, because Brew was an old friend of his, and he had a whole box of them. I got to get my tenor back, he said. I should have hocked this alto instead. I guess I should have known better. You get more gigs with a tenor, you know what I mean? And I just got busted from this job across the bay, like I'm trying to show the piano man the right changes to this tune, and he gets all pissed off because he's the leader, and he don't like to look stupid. So I tell him, man, like you know, some tunes got more than three chords in them. And he says, if I'm such a great genius, what am I doing playing in his band for? And I should take my ax and go find another job. So I might be going down the coast, he said. There's more jobs down in LA. I gotta get a good gig, man. Like maybe a nice studio job. Like I'm getting tired of just playing rock and roll blues. You know what I mean? Don't knock it though, if that's all you can get. If you don't mind getting paid for taking your solos all on one note. We laughed, sang a few one note choruses, and then Jeff said he had to get some sleep. And then we finished off the wine. I gotta rest up for the session, he said. I might be blowing all night. And that was the last time I saw Jeff. But then about a year later, I heard they found him in his Chevy down the coast with his head bashed in, all the windows busted, his horns were missing, and there was an empty gig bag and a book on the dash and a bloody wine bottle in the sand next to the car. That's the last I heard, and that's the last, excuse me, that's the last I heard, and that's all I know. That was back in 57, or it could have been 58. I can't remember anymore. But sometimes, even now, I feel like I want to get a jug of Mountain Red, listen to that Brew Moore record he gave me. You know the one with the weird, purple, snaky, elephant trunk looking thing on the cover? And I want to try once again to start reading Finnegan's Wake, the way he said. Just read it, man. Absorb the words like the way you listen to music. And sometimes I just find myself singing a few one-note choruses, like a blues for Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our next poet is going to be uh, this is another talented brother here. Uh, been involved in several recitals here. Uh, let's give a great round of applause for uh, Patrick Johnson. You want to do the mic? Hello. Just want to read one, one poem. It's called "Do You Read Me Over." Um, not long after the death sentence I received was lifted and I was exonerated, my spirit was revived. I decided that a change would be necessary in order 
for me not to fall victim to the same circumstances that had impaired me before, not allowing anything to persuade my thinking or to intrude upon my concentration. The first thing I would have to do is to develop my thought perception to its strongest possible degree. This would enable me to block out any and all irrelevant, unuseful conversation that only served to diminish my mental state of well-being. This would also shield me from the unwanted pain and misery that people tend to impose upon you when they fail to communicate their thoughts properly. No, long, no longer shall I be drawn into meaningless chit-chat that's based on gossip or that he say, she say shit. Spare me the pain. I will not serve as interpreter of senseless illogical words that's inflicted by ignorance and stupidity. You must know what you say and say what you know, all bullshit aside. Be aware, all information not intelligently thought out before transmitted will be blocked out to ensure against misunderstandings. All clear signals containing valuable information will be properly interpreted and responded to in the same fashion that, is it, that, it is in, that it is transmitted, thus eliminating all forms of miscommunication. Do you read me? Over. Thank you. Okay, uh, how many poets are left? Okay, uh, you're uh, La Lavella Brandon? Oh, okay, Lavella Brandon and Bob Booker? Okay, okay, uh, our next poet is gonna be Bob Booker. Bob Booker is gonna come up and do a poem. Let's give him a great round of applause. Welcome. Hey, let's give it up for Larry and Linda for putting all this together in the branch here. Larry and Linda, woo! All right. What a show. Power of the word. Power of the word. This is a poem, um, I was going to read a Gwendolyn Brooks poem. Has everybody heard of Gwendolyn Brooks? The great, she was the first woman to won, win the Pulitzer Prize. Black American poet. Beautiful spirit. Anyway, she inspired a poem uh, a few years ago. And this is called Mama Made for Gwendolyn. Mama made nine kids in her lifetimes, and it got crowded and crazy almost every night on a different couch in a different bed with brothers and mothers and neighbors spilling in, spilling out never knowing why or when or where tomorrow or what to eat and what future. But we all managed to scrape by, looking ahead across the street, around the corner, behind the tree, reading our Bible and thinking straight as an old owl that goes back for centuries, and by morning, school meant survival is a blessing if you make it to the first grade. And it is a real life after all. Thank you. Okay, uh, our last poet is gonna be Love Vella Brandon. Okay, let's give her a great round of applause. There. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think I came here last year. I have one poem that I would like to read. I want to read others, but I'll just read one. Um, I think it has a title. Um, no, it doesn't have a title. Life is beautiful, love is wonderful, hope is peaceful, patience is hopeful, humbleness is love, learning is life, black women everywhere. I know the cry very well, for I am a black woman who has shared part of the burdens that we bear. When our men don't seem to care, 
for I've shared that feeling of despair. Black women everywhere, when our families seem to vanish in the air, I seem to hold on to this family affair. When our jobs seem all helpless, hopeless, and far away dream, and a, a far away dream, I've shared that scene on many things. Black women everywhere, my faith, religion, and belief seems to fit so neat that I feel I need a heart so meek to keep these things I feel in me, allowing me my musical beat. We are strong, but these things must not be prolonged. Black women everywhere, these things, say, these things I say and do care may bring comfort in the strangest way, but I'm sure that we'll cry for years to come for the rainbow that only burdens can overcome. Thank you. That's uh, all the poets, huh? Well, once again, uh, uh, hey, it's been real. Uh, oh, one more point. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, once again, I would like to, you, you are the ones who made this a success because you showed up, uh, you uh, parlayed the spoken word into our 10th anniversary and once again, this, uh, is a smashing success, and this just shows that um, look at look at all the people out here. They missed they missed a really wonderful program like this place. Uh, it was packed, but you you made it a success. But um, once again, one of the most positive programs in the entire Bay Area, in fact, in the country, we have just witnessed tonight. That's right. And uh, it's unfortunate that the powers to be are not here to see this, because I think this is something that people throughout the country should be able to uh, witness, like this was really a wonderful celebration here of some uh, really uh, gifted poets, and, and then we have the beautiful artwork here. Um, Malik! Malik, uh, give the brother a great round of applause. <laughs> give yourself a round of applause. And we look forward to celebrating our 11th anniversary uh, next year. So come and join us again next year as we celebrate our, uh, the millennium and our 11th uh, Annie Wadden, Bayview Annie Wadden uh, National Poetry Recital. So again, thank you and good evening. And let's give our cameraman Dave a great round of applause. <laughs> and. Uh, also, our branch manager, let's give uh, Linda Brooks Burton a wonderful round of applause. And her staff, they always do a wonderful job. And thank you and good evening. Good evening.